Capcom puts a technologist at the end. So, you know, this can only go wrong. You know, put it like yeah, so, so, um, and even now, you know, I'm going to talk about a, a, a topic where probably both previous speakers have said that this is just hype. Um, which is good because it's built on other hype called cloud. Um, but, but the good thing is that actually I uh, uh, great respect for Seed Fund. Um, uh, it was great to see a number of the names of the companies that they've, they funded. And actually, as Amazon, we're really proud to actually be powering most of those startups. And, and quite a few of you in the room maybe are, are startups. And, um, and I've talked to a lot of our customers today. And I'm, um, this, I think Redbus is one of the great examples where um, a company that didn't exist before makes such a big impact on society. Yeah, by, and we're really proud as, as Amazon Web Services to be able to power that. So I'm not going to talk that much about Amazon Web Services in, in, in that sense. Um, more talking a bit about uh, data analytics. Although many people think that big data is all about beta, data analytics. And I hope that if you walk out of here today that you understand that there is much more to big data than data analytics. That it's a whole pipeline of different processes and that in, to actually make progress in this whole world of big data, we need to make progress in each of those steps of the pipeline. So this is going to be a semi-business, semi-technology talk, uh, and I hope that you actually you know, you get some better insight into this whole process. Um, first of all, um, you know, work, working on one hand for a bookshop, I need to advise you to read a book. This is one of the books that actually started that whole area of, uh, of big data analytics. It's called The Fourth Paradigm, Data Intensive Science. Um, uh, Jim Gray, a great researcher um, at IBM and later at Microsoft, turned this, uh, this, this uh, coined this term called the fourth paradigm, which is in, in sort of analytics and science where the third paradigm is really computational science and the fourth paradigm is data intensive science, where we actually see that all sciences are changing. It's not just that computer science or business is changing into a data intensive science, History is becoming a data intensive science. Psychology is becoming a data intensive science. And this book, um, this is a short URL if you want to follow it, uh, pick it up, um, uh, gives you great insight into the beginning of all of this. Um, more importantly, if you buy this on your Kindle, it only costs you 99 cents, which is actually the price every ebook should take. But that's a whole different discussion to have. Um, so this is, this is in general, I think, sort of the, the popular uh, description of big data, yeah? The collection and analysis of very large amounts of data to give your company a, a competitive edge, uh, and whatever that means. In general, I think big data is really different from data analytics in the past. Yeah? Data analytics in the past, the traditional BI, is really all about questions you had, and then you knew what kind of data model to have and what kind of data you wanted to collect. But big data is all about, you know, if we collect as much data about our business processes, about our customers, then we must be able to gain a lot more insight than what we were able to do before. And that's, I think, sort of the, 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 the basis of why there's such great uh, enthusiasm around this area and why we see so many new companies actually arriving here. And, and you know, to actually make a point to the previous speaker, I don't think the end of new companies in big data has, has started yet. Even though there may be multiple companies already there, there's a lot of innovation to be done because actually we haven't seen the, the end of the impact of data intensive uh, computing on our businesses yet. And so one of the points that I really want to make is that business intelligence or data analytics used to be something that was only done by enterprises. Yeah, you had big warehouse, ETL, all those things around it. But what we see is that Every young business that is being launched today, next to building a, a customer-facing product, at the same time starts doing data analytics on the site. And why? Because many young companies that are being built are being built in a way more lean way. They actually will launch what we now these days call a minimal viable product. Yeah? And then very quickly, you start iterating with your customer to drive the product in the direction where your customers actually think that this is most useful. To be able to do that, you need to have data analytics to understand how your customers are using your, your products. And quite a few of these young businesses are not only considering that this sort of data analytics or data collection 
as being um, you know, part to drive a better customer experience, but also often to think about whether this is maybe an additional revenue stream. Yeah? A larger insight in all of your customers may be some insight that you actually may be willing to, um, to, uh, to actually create more revenue out of. But being a technologist, uh, my, my definition for big data, from my point of view, as a CTO, is very different. Yeah, so, for me, big data is when your data sets become so large that you have to innovate in the whole pipeline of data analytics. And the whole pipeline has five main stages. Yeah? Collect, store, organize, analyze, and share. And in each of those five steps, and we'll go through each of those five steps, we will need to innovate if we want to be successful in the whole process of big data. And so many of the examples that I will give will be either from, from Amazon itself or from many of the companies that run on the Amazon Cloud Platform. So it may seem somewhat Amazon-centric, um, but that's because that's where I know most of the examples from. One of the bigger differences between um, previous business intelligence and big data is that, in essence, uh, collecting more data, even data that you really don't know what you're going to do with in the beginning, is much more important. Bigger is better in this case. Yeah, because the more data you collect, the finer grain result you can create. And let me give you some examples where that absolutely fails. Yeah, so Amazon is a big known um, producer and um, you know, consumer of big data in its, uh, in its recommendation engine. We've been doing this from the beginning. So let me show you a few places where um, the recommendations absolutely fail. Uh, so one of them is, if you buy an oil filter, we also recommend that you actually buy some perfume and uh, the Jackson 5. Yeah? More importantly, we actually advise you to actually, if you've bought this set of Japanese steak knives, to actually also buy Windows 7. <laughs> uh, now maybe, uh, maybe the other way around would be more appropriate. If you've just bought Windows 7, you should also buy a set of steak knives. Um, <laughs> That's a joke. I actually run Windows, yeah? So, um, <laughs> but actually, so when you go into Google and actually to, uh, type in uh, funny Amazon recommendations, you'll find a whole set of these. Most of those being kind of adult-oriented, so we can't put them up here, but please do that, and you'll have great fun with that. What is the failure in each of those areas? It's actually that we're making recommendations on not enough data. If we would have collected, in this case, most of those recommendations, we shouldn't have made these recommendations. We should have known that we did not have enough data to actually, with great confidence, make these recommendations. And so that's more important. So you know, where if we would have had more data, very fine-grained results. But bigger is better in this case. The more data you collect, the finer-grained results you can give. Now, there's one, one really big point, and that's really what I want to make. Why is there this big connection between cloud computing and big data? Is a point I already said earlier is that the difference between old-style business intelligence is that in the old world, you already knew what kind of questions you were going to ask. And that knowing actually drove the data model that you were going to use. And that, again, drove the way that you were collecting your data. In the new world of big data, this is actually the inverse. You are going to collect as much data as possible without actually that you have any clue what the data model is going to be, that you're going to layer over that. And actually, you have no idea really what the fine-grained questions are that you, in the end, are going to ask. Much of this process is going to be iterative. You are going to you know, experiment. You're going to look at the data. You're going to drive it in direction, um, you know, end up in blind alleys, go back, and find other ways to look at your data. So given that you no longer know how much you're going to store, you no longer know how much computation you need. There's big uncertainty about the resources that you need for this. And that's why this match between cloud and big data is so important. Now, where cloud gives you access to um, basically an unlimited set of resources, and where you only pay for those resources when you really need it. And so going, doing this experimentation, going into different direction, collecting more data, doing sort of serendipitous uh, an analysis, is actually really matching up with cloud computing. 
Yeah, so the uncertainty around this actually drives um, a great new style of resource usage. So big data really requires you to have no limits in your resources. Because you need to be able to store as much as you want. You need to be able to have, you know, use a thousand CPUs or 10,000 CPUs for your computation whenever you would want to do so. So let's look at this pipeline. Yeah, and let's look, take a look at some of the examples uh, in cloud and actually big data in each of those steps. So the collection of data is actually the first most important piece. Yeah, and so I'll give you a few examples of how different companies are doing this. This is a young business out of, uh, out of the Netherlands, Amsterdam, where Coupa is a data, is an uh, analytics company that works with uh, larger brands to actually track how customers are actually using, using their brands. So they have this sort of panel that's installed on many different workstations. They have tens of thousands of customers actually um, using, their, uh, using their software, which tracks the way that they're using the web. So for them, the way that they get data into uh, the cloud where they're doing most of their analysis is they have all this panel, collect this data, and then push it into a queuing system, which then actually takes it out of the queues, puts it into the analytics en engines, put it into a database for further display later on. And these are then the kind of displays that you get. You know, how, to, how do different newspapers online compare in terms of their readership? So queuing is one area of, uh, of usage. Um, Another area where there's a lot of innovation is actually really in big scale uh, research. This is uh, oceanic grief research all over the world where this data is flowing back into the, the bigger analytics uh, networks of uh, the universities of the US. And then there we've peered up those networks into the cloud so they can actually stream this data directly into the cloud. And it's not only these kinds of scientists that are doing it, there's um, folks from for example, the European Space Agency, as well as the Japanese Space Agency and NASA that are actually all streaming uh, uh, telemetrics data directly into the cloud through these kind of networks. Uh, so many companies actually would like to have dedicated lines. We've built, you know, sometimes you think about the cloud as something that sits somewhere else and where you mandatory have to go over the internet. Actually, we've added things, functionality to the cloud to make sure that you can build your own MPLS circuits into it to actually send your data with guaranteed uh, latency and guaranteed bandwidth into the cloud. But sometimes, you know, sometimes these data sets are just too large to actually send them over the network. And so you shouldn't underestimate the bandwidth of a FedEx box, yeah? And so put your, uh, put your data on disks and actually, as a cloud provider, we just will be happy to take your disks and load them that way into the network. But there's many more pieces actually to this collection and the integration into different processes where there's a lot more innovation that needs to happen. So storing, the storing piece is actually something that you can imagine pretty easily. I think, you know, we're talking here about lots and lots and lots of amounts of data, so you need unlimited amount of storage. But Razorfish is a, is a good example of a company that was confronted with this. Razorfish is part of Avenue A, um, a big media empire in the US. And Razorfish does all of the analytics. They do customer uh, tracking. They do clickstream analysis, things like that. Razorfish was, from being an analytics company, were actually becoming a storage company. They were storing, they were collecting so much data from their customers that their expertise was going into how to actually quickly build out their storage rates. Their salespeople were completely blocked by the fact how fast the storage guys could build out their storage arrays. And a good example there in this, in, you know, in 2008, 2009, when sort of the world was in crisis, nobody knew what was going to happen with e-commerce. You know, how many people were going to buy, build, buy online? Um, was this going to be a big depression or was this going to be maybe a big surge? And so they had no idea how much storage and how much compute capacity they needed. And it turned out that actually in 2009, the holiday season, we saw a 2x rise in sort of e-commerce activity. If these guys would have been on their own infrastructure, they would have been dead as a company because they would not have been able to meet the SLA towards their customers. Yeah, so this is an area where they, at the same time, were able to actually reduce their cost by more than 50% by actually being really adaptive and using cloud resources to, um, to build their uh, company on. 
So organized, once you have your data in the cloud, there's many different steps around uh, that you have to take around your data before you can actually even start analyzing. And some of that is around data quality control. Now, as you imagine that here you've collected large amounts of unstructured data where many actually data records may be able to match up, but you have no idea whether this is the truth or not. So controlling data, especially when it comes around user-generated data, is very important. Yeah, so around reviews, for example, did this person really buy this product? Or is this somebody else inserting this data into your data stream just to actually try and trick you? Yeah, so correcting data, is this really the correct data? Uh, validating it, you know, is this really data about that particular company? Um, and actually enriching data for many many unstructured environments, yeah, you would like to take that data into a more structured environment so that you can actually work on it. Now, it turns out that most of these, uh, most of these steps are really well done by humans, much better often than by, uh, than by computer programs. And so for, take, for example, controlling data of your uh, user-generated content. It's often, so often humans need to have just five microseconds to look at some text to understand whether this is a computer-generated piece of text or whether this is really a human that is actually typing these things in. So a system like Amazon Mechanical Turk actually plays a very important role with many of our companies to actually control their data and to enrich their data. But another area which I think in the whole organization of data is you know, how to get the right data scientist to work on your problems. And whether you're a small company, a medium-sized company, or maybe even a large company, you may not be able to afford yourself a data scientist. Now, yet, there are lots of data scientists in pharmaceutical companies and all companies that are tremendously bored with the work that they do. And Kaggle is a company from, uh, from Australia that has a very interesting uh, perspective on that. They actually crowdsource um, data scientists for you. So you give data sets to Kaggle, and they will actually find data scientists for you to work on their problems. Yeah, so really, their proposition is really that there is a mismatch between the places where data are being generated at the moment and where we actually want to do the analysis and where the data scientists are. Yeah, so they use crowdsourcing for this uh, problem. So one of the many of these uh, problems that they have, they do them as competitions. So this is one, of a, one good example where the Heritage Network in the, uh, in the US is a healthcare provider. Um, and actually, so they've taken, I think, five million healthcare records or healthcare claims records, completely anonymized, made that set public, and asked data scientists around the world to find predictive models who of those patients in those records are likely to end up in hospital in the coming year. The ones with the best predictive model is going to get $3 million. Yeah, and it seems like a large amount of money, but you know, the amount of savings that can be done in healthcare by really being in the predictive uh, analysis business to really understand which customers or which of your patients or which of your um, which of people in your network to able to target because they are at high risk before they end up in the hospital is extremely important. And of course, you know, this is the area where we've seen most publications about, where everybody knows much about. And there's a, there's a whole range of companies in this, uh, in this area um, that has been started in the past two, three years that do a lot of innovative work. Um, we've already heard about Asta Data just you know, being acquired uh, as well. And there's a whole range of other companies actually starting up. Karma Sphere, um, one that's actually pretty exciting at the moment. But there's a lot of things happening in this world, and we'll see another 100 companies at least um, in this area in probably in the coming year arising, all with new kind of ways of doing analysis. And, and why, why do we see this, this range of companies uh, happening? It's because we've mostly focused on just basic analytic techniques and not thought that much about actually connecting business questions to those techniques. Yeah? So one of the techniques that is very popular at the moment and where most people talk about is, is MapReduce and its open source equivalent, Hadoop. But Hadoop is a blunt force hammer, a very big hammer, actually. And going, actually, from having these low-level techniques, which are very powerful, 
in which it can really distribute quite well, but having business problems all the way at the other end, going from the business problem to actually using the underlying technology is really hard. And in this space in between here is where we're going to see most innovation, because actually translating business problems into lower level techniques are going to be, uh, is one of the areas where we see a lot of innovation and where nobody has actually found the real golden egg yet um, in, in terms of the approach of analytics. So there's many companies that use analytics to actually drive to improve their business. Netflix being a, a probably a very, a very known one, mainly because they've had this big price that they put out to, to gain better analytics, but every process, every process within Netflix, and I know that because they run uh, on top of the Amazon Web Services, Every piece of that process is being logged, is being tracked, and is being continuously evaluated how they can do better. Not only for their customers, but also internally, in terms of driving how can we improve internal processes to be better, to be more efficient, to be more fault tolerant, um, and where do we see shifts happening within the worlds of our customers? Um, so I, I'll give you a few examples of a smaller company. SoundCloud is a, uh, is a popular young company out of Berlin, and they also have offices in, in the Valley at the moment. So SoundCloud started off as a platform where musicians could share their music, and then where there's a lot of um, listeners coming. And in essence, behind the scenes, SoundCloud was an analytics company. Because what they did, they give to musicians lots of insight about their listeners, they give listeners much, a lot of insight into what different musics they could actually explore. And they had a sort of third revenue stream, which was actually giving information back to the music labels about what are actually the current hot trends and what are the things that they should be looking at. Now, SoundCloud changed their ways a little bit. They are now going to be the audio platform for the web, where you can store any audio, not whether it's music or not. And, um, that they're being pretty successful about it. But for them, it's really important to very quickly understand what different verticals actually this data is being stored and then looking at those verticals and immediately put business development resources against that such that they can drive that and explore that and actually make that business grow in that area. And you know, any, any one of your popular internet tools, all of them, all of them are data driven. Yeah, whether it is actually Etsy, which seems like a, uh, a pretty friendly marketplace, but they do a lot of recommendations, they do a lot of advertisement, and all of that is data-driven. The same goes for Playfish, which is actually gaming, whether it's Foursquare or Yelp, all of these are actually important. And so Rediff here in, uh, in India is another company that's using uh, Amazon's Elastic MapReduce to actually continuously improve their uh, search algorithms. So every night they collect all the information about the searches that were done on that platform and then feed that against the improvements of their algorithms to continuously improve. Yeah, so this is what we see with most young businesses, continuously use data analytics to improve the service that you deliver to your customers. And it's not only about all these e-commerce and all these websites. This is an, uh, a Norwegian company that actually built um, it's a spellings checkers for dyslexic people. Can you imagine how hard that problem is? Yeah? So people that are actually spelling things the wrong way around, but they, uh, actually think that it is correct. Yeah? And how do you, how do you build spellings checkers? Uh, so they continuously use and evaluate wrong spelled um, corpuses of text to actually find better ways to build spellings checkers. And it's not only just young businesses, it's also in the US, for example, the, the government. And this is a good example because it shows that it's not only MapReduce uh, that is being used to do this sort of web-based large-scale analytics. Recovery.gov is uh, the website of the uh, US government where all the recovery money that is, has been spent is being tracked how that is actually being applied. And so, you know, at a very deep, fine-grained level, you can go to this website, drill down into your local constituents area and actually figure out um, you know, how that money is being spent. Well, this is an, uh, a complete website, but it's built on very traditional technologies. It runs on the Amazon Cloud, but it's actually using Microsoft operating system and Microsoft SharePoint as being the, the workflow engine. It uses S3 for all the, the geographic mapping, and it uses SAP business object to do, actually do the deep analysis. 
So it's not just the new tools that actually play a very important role in this business in, in this web area, but it are the traditional companies that are finding new ways to actually help there as well. And so we also see a whole new area arising of data analytics with the use of GP GPUs. So GPUs used to be just graphic processing engines. But we found that actually these graphic processing engines are actually great parallel uh, computing tools as well. So the general purpose GPU processing has become a really important tool for doing very fast, high scale and analytics. And so for a long time, GPUs were ignored by most of the analytics folks because many companies didn't want to take the risk of actually using GPUs because nobody knew where that area was going to go. When we actually launched these as sort of units in the cloud that people could use, these became extremely popular because everybody wants to try and see how they can use this GPU programming for their own uh, needs. And so we have routinely uh, have companies actually firing up clusters with 30,000 cores to do, their, uh, to do their analytics for only a few hours. Yeah? Many analytics processes are very easily paralyzable. And in this case, these, uh, the cycle computing guys, they fire up clusters of 30,000 cores, run it for one or two hours, and actually get enormous results where normally you would actually have to wait months for to actually see the completion of those results. Sharing is actually equally important. There is an end part to sort of analysis. And what we see is that instead of that, in the past, data analytics would have been a nice dashboard for everybody to use. But quite more often, the result of analytics is data sets that may actually be as large as the original data set, if not larger. And so we see a whole new range of tools arriving, especially around visualization or visualization of the intermediary steps. I've seen quite a few analytics already that actually are producing JPEGs of each of the intermediary steps instead of giving you some sort of three-day model which you can ex easily import into Excel. But actually sharing among different among parties is, is equally important. And a good example here is, um, is the NASDAQ. So NASDAQ came to, uh, came to Amazon because they had to build this tool, this market replay tool, and if they had to do that on their own platform, it would be a sort of $50 million enterprise rewrite of their complete backend. And they didn't want to do it because they didn't really know whether that product was going to be successful or not. So they started storing all market data into Amazon S3 and built this sort of air app that you can actually then run on your own desktop, connect back to the Amazon storage engine and, and use that. Um, so this is actually a tool you can download from data.nasdaq.com um, and actually play with that yourself. But during this process, the NASDAQ actually started realizing that maybe they are not the only ones that can build really good analytics tools. And so they decided that at the end of last year to actually open up the complete historical market data set for everybody else to use, uh, for pay, of course, but it's an easy data set to use. Um, they used a company called uh, Xnite to actually help them create an API on top of this, and this is now open for everyone to consume. So it's not often that the results of your data are useful for your company internally, but you actually may see additional revenue streams coming out of the data that you are creating out of your original data sets. And there's lots of uh, public data sets available. Uh, there's many of them that actually, for example, the, the government in the US has data.gov where all data of the government, of the US government is available. And we see this happening in many other company, uh, countries around the world. Uh, but also, for example, in the UN, um, they had 190 different databases. It's all collected together now for a single API up front end where you can actually access all of that data. And there's quite a few data that actually Amazon hosts um, around genomics, but also uh, around geolocation, um, around census data, all of these, which are free for everybody else to use. With that, so this is sort of the whole area of big data, although it has a lot of big hype around it, more importantly is that in each of those five steps that we've seen, you know, collect, store, organize, analyze, and share, in each of those areas, we're going to see a tremendous amount of innovation in the coming two years happening. Yeah, and this will completely change the way 
that customers will start, or that actually businesses will start looking at their customers and actually be able to actually be much more customer focused, which is the core driver for their success in the coming years. And it's not just, you know, not just the, the simple lamp stack tools and the open source tools, it is also companies like SAP that are putting up whole new innovative services for everybody to use. In this case, it's, uh, it's also an example that runs on the Amazon Cloud. It's SAP Carbon Impact On Demand, where you, from all of your ERP systems, can actually have data flow back into this service, and where SAP for you is sort of calculating the, uh, the carbon impact of all of your servers and all of your local processing that you're doing. So with that, uh, I hope that I've actually given you a little bit of insight into what are the different steps in the big data process. Um, I hope I, uh, at least I kept some of you in the room here. Um, I hope that you be actually be um, inspired to go work on each of those different steps and each of the different processes, because this will have tremendous impact on how businesses are going to be successful. Uh, something that one of the early speakers said is that the only way that businesses are going to be successful is if they are completely customer focused. And you need to really be understanding what your customers want. You have to measure, you have to continuously look at your customers and use data analytics to improve your service to do so. With that, thank you very much. If you saw the uh, previous, can I have the previous slide back actually? No? Okay. Uh, so if you need to reach me, I'm Werner at Amazon. I'm happy to take your questions there. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. A picture. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.